Coming up on this week in computer hardware, six core mobile CPUs. Let's talk 10th gen Intel Comet Lake. Minecraft gets NVIDIA RTX new gear from Alienware and Apple Watch 5. Rumors are rolling. All that more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 530, recorded on August 22nd, 2019. 10th gen Intel CPUs and Minecraft RTX. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most affordable, most helpful. And you know what? We're going to get more complicated, and I'm going to put a, qu a question right now out to the audience. If there is somebody out there who can send us Twitch at twit.tv, a guide what you would do to maximize performance on SQL Server databases, send that out to us or tweet at Sebastian Peeker at Patrick Norton because we are curious because I have a question asking just that very thing. And what I know about SQL Server databases is completely from the client end, and I can just about fill up a matchbook cover with a crayon. We're not talking about mm. crayons. We're going to be talking about 10th core, 10th core, 10th gen Intel uh, processor Sebastian Peek from PCPer.com. I believe you have some thoughts on the latest round of Intel processors. Of course, always. <laughs> and yes, the, the family it has finally joined together all different process nodes living in perfect harmony with 10th gen Intel because that was a great segue into our first story. 10th gen Comet Lake is here. We've already heard about Ice Lake. That's the 10 nanometer 10th gen. Right. And I'm sure Intel would be you know, happy if you just assumed that everything 10th gen is also 10 nanometer, but alas, for their more... That would like, be a big assumption. <laughs> yeah. For their performance yeah. powerhouse parts, as they put it, they've just used their highly optimized 14 nanometer process. So I don't know how many pluses come after this 14 nanometer, but it's state-of-the-art 14 nanometer stuff, and you can be catty right. about the fact that they clearly have not got 10 nanometers to the point where their entire new 10th gen line can be on 10 nanometer for mobile. But it's rather impressive anyway to look at this because their their big talking point with this launch is that it's the first time they've gone six cores from the U-series processor. And for those who are not familiar, U-series is the 25-watt max TDP stuff that you'll actually find in the higher-end thin and light notebooks that aren't making the use of that Y series stuff, which is the really low power, lower clock speed, fewer cores. So now a future MacBook Pro or other high end laptop can have a 25 watt part with a six core CPU instead of having to try to shove a 45 watt part in there. And uh, often with this disastrous be, results. Right. So we, we, I think we've, we've, beaten that particular horse to death, the idea that you have an ultra-thin fanless design, which is great as long as you're not trying to do anything particularly complicated or, say, open a photo uh, or type really fast. I'm exaggerating only a tiny bit on that last one, but we've seen uh, parts that should fit within the TDP of passively cooled enclosures uh, sort of just fall apart uh, when actual workloads are applied, something that lasts for more than, say, a microsecond or two, like if you want to render video, yeah. if you're doing video editing, if you're doing photo editing. Um, this is interesting, especially, uh, you know, obviously for me, like editing video, uh, this would also be something if you are compiling code, anything you do, or maybe, you know, diddling with SQL databases, anything that involves lots of cores, this is a big advantage uh, if you still want to maintain, like if you want an XPS 13, if you want an X1, if you want a relatively light, thin laptop, this is a pretty big deal to have that many cores in this kind of TDP. Nobody's got numbers yet, as far as I know, because these parts aren't going to start shipping until uh, October and uh you know, uh, and for me, like, I'm really curious to see what the Dell XPS 13 looks like, uh, you know, and they're adding 10th gen uh, processors all over their lineup, uh, Dell. Uh, not so much on the high end Lenovo stuff, and I haven't gotten the word on what's going on with uh, HP. Um, are you are you excited about these? Or are you kind of like, meh? I think it's more exciting than you would think just looking at the 
on paper because like compared to Ice Lake, which is the 10 nanometer part again, those have right. the fast new Gen 11 graphics. They're lower clock speeds than this Comet Lake stuff, which tops out at 4.9 gigahertz for the four core eight thread part. And that six core part, I think tops out at 4.7 gigahertz for the single core boost speed. But I mean, nothing wrong with more cores at a lower power envelope. I'm very curious to get actual laptops in hand and see how they work over extended workloads and kind of monitor the frequencies and things. But, you know, right. it's, it's disappointing that, that they're not coming in at 10 nanometer, but at the same time, I'm guessing that 10 nanometer is going to take some time to actually mature and get to the point where it can be close to five gigahertz with a six core part. Right. And maybe when that comes, we'll see Intel laptops in another year or so that are at 15 watts with six gig, you know, six cores or maybe even eight cores and hitting these high clock speeds too. But right now it looks like 10 nanometer is going to be more for those consumer focused devices and you get the faster memory for those, which drives those faster graphics and, the Comet Lake stuff you'll probably be seeing on something that's more mobile workstation focused or more of a mm -hmm. professional solution where you've got discrete graphics, perhaps. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I would love to see a 25 watt notebook with six cores and a discrete GPU and kind of see what that can do as far as battery life and overall performance. Right. So it's, it's really, I mean, uh, these parts I mean, are it, only as good as how they're implemented. So because they're laptops, we just have to see yes. what the laptops look like, how they perform. Yeah, and it's, that's been one of the interesting things about watching uh, Dell's implementation is I've seen, for example, an XPS 13 outperform a larger laptop with what looks like a more significant cooling system, um, you know, with an older part. It is fascinating to me to watch how much TDP impacts uh, or, or the, I should say the, 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 I hate to say the solution because it's such a marketing world, uh, yeah. marketing word, but you know, these thermal solution is utterly critical to the performance of these parts, especially some of these ones where they're really trying to actually, uh, push the part. Where is it? Uh, the, the Nantech article, uh, that uh, you link to in the show notes. Ryan Smith wrote this up. Intel launches Comet Lake U and Comet Lake Y up to six cores for thin and light laptops. It's a good read. They get pretty in depth. And like one of the things they point out is um, they are like obviously all the Comet Lake Y parts are, are uh, have a base TDP of seven watts, um, which is two watts less than Ice Lake Ice Lake Y parts. And I'm really curious to see what it does for battery life. Um, but some of these are running at fairly high clock speeds. Um, the four core i7 10510U, uh, that's got like a 4.9 gigahertz turbo clock. Now, admittedly, that's for a single core, um, but that is, you know, a biscuit away, like 100 hertz away from what Intel's uh, uh, desktop parts. And and they, they spelled that out really clear in the article. It's like, that's, that's a... That's a, that's a lot of turbo in a very, very tiny amount of wattage, so... I will um, I will caution I not caution that's not the right word but I will say that I think it's interesting to look at these and see how Intel kind of pieces these launches together and how they determine right. clock speeds because of the performance they're looking for and it makes sense when you're looking at having to hit a certain target as far as the CPU clock mm -hmm. because of the architecture they're using the Ice Lake parts are using a new CPU architecture called Sunny Cove and these new Newly announced Comet Lake parts are actually still Skylake. They're still that sixth gen right. core architecture. It's been refined and massaged, I'm sure, to this point, but I don't think you could get the performance that they're they're claiming here without really aggressive turbo frequencies. Same architecture at the same clock speed is pretty much, you know, obvious that you're going to get a similar result. So they, they don't want to have Parts right. that perform simil similarly to, to the outgoing Coffee Lake 8th Gen stuff in laptops. So Right. Oh, my goodness. Uh, new chipset, by the way. Intel 400 series uh, brings Wi-Fi 6 support native to yeah. the chipset, which will be incredibly important for some people after these parts ship later this year in the holiday shopping season. That's when the bulk we, the bulk of the 10th gen parts are going to be shipping uh, holiday season this year, like October yeah. at the earliest. Um, so if you've been dreaming of next generation Wi-Fi, this may be your excuse to buy that new router. <laughs> so. Indeed. Uh, the uh, It's interesting. Uh, Alienware and Dell 
dropped a ton of gear at Gamescom. I got to see, um, they did a tour in San Francisco. I got to see some of the stuff I got my eyeballs on. Um, the Alienware Aurora desktop. I have some video of this, which I do not have accessible at the moment. Um, it's a beautiful toolless case design that opens up and lets you get inside of it. And it's, uh, I feel for Alienware, it's a fairly sophisticated and sedate design. If you scroll up a little bit, it's the one, there it is. It's black and white. Keep going. That's the one. It um, looks, you know what? It looks like a giant cable modem. Kind of. It's got that Motorola surfboard kind of look way. to it. I, oh, like I, it. I like it. I, the I have Dell a fondness for these Aurora one? desktops in general. I think the cases are kind of cool. Yeah. And they probably get they are really cool. less love in the enthusiast cool. community because it's a pre-built solution, but they're nice. Well, you know, the other one that was interesting is the G5 desktop, and there's a picture of it next to a monitor, and it's got a nice, you know, the the version they were selling of it had a nice glass side, purple lighting in there, nice accents. Um, they're running ninth gen Intel Core processors, NVIDIA GeForce, TTX, RTX graphics cards. Um, they have a 240 hertz refresh rate 27 inch gaming monitor uh the alienware aw2720hf and i want to point out something when you look at the stand on these monitors on the alienwares they used to have this massive sort of um front of a spaceship kind of design uh or, or maybe a front of a you know a, a b1 uh bomber kind of thing it was just it was just this massive sort of triangulated thing that took up a mess of space and they've toned that down a lot both for that uh, 27 inch gaming monitor with a 240 hertz refresh rate uh and they have a gorgeous i love 34 inch curved monitors um the alienware 34 the aw 3420 dw um 1900r curve so it's actually really really close to the one i use now a 1700 which is a nice broad wide curve it's not a narrow wrap around your head curve um NVIDIA G-Sync, 120 uh, hertz refresh rate, which looked amazing. If you have the GPU to feed the pixels at 120 hertz to that monitor, uh, it is a really nice experience. And something I really didn't expect, they had a 55-inch OLED television, or what they call a gaming monitor, the AW5520QF, uh, 4K UHD running at 120 hertz. Uh, they're claiming half millisecond response time, uh, AMD Radeon FreeSync, um, you know, and they tried to make the back of the monitor look nice. The back of the monitor, the, the back of that 55-inch OLED uh, blends with the Alienware Aurora desktop design stylings, if you will. Um, and then uh, the one last monitor they had, uh, the Dell 32, uh, the S3220DGF um, FreeSync 2 HDR, up to 165 hertz refresh rates, face a certified display HDR 400, so not super bright, but bright enough for, for a lot of, basically bright enough for gaming, uh, you know, not optimal for HDR, but it's kind of the entry level for HDR at this point. Um, that's a nice looking 32 inch monitor on that one, so, so much shiny, and uh, mice too. Can we do the Alienware wireless gaming mouse AW310M? It looks kind of like a squid. It feels really good in your hand. And they reduced kind of the button count. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. I just want to, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, it, maybe it was just my misimpression, but like the, the Alienware RGB gaming mouse, the AW510M, it's like a 10 fully programmable buttons, but it was like, I was looking at this and thinking like, it's a rounded design. It fits good in the palm. I like the little squid tails on it. Uh, everything felt kind of natural. Uh, and they didn't try to like, we have 374 programmable buttons, one that requires a trained cat and two monkeys. Um, it wasn't one of those mice where you're looking at it with like, who can operate this thing? Uh, it was, it was, you know, it was toning down the excesses and just making a fairly functional piece of hardware. So, so what you're saying is that mice get a little out of control in their attempt to differentiate and become the equivalent of an <laughs> N64 controller. And if yeah. you haven't used one of those in a while, remember the controller that required three hands to operate properly? Or if you had your yeah. hand in the middle on the joystick, then you couldn't reach the D-pad without taking your hand off the controller and moving it. And then that's where the left <laughs> rudder button was. And then it's, it's yeah. A peculiar oh and design that was apparently designed for aliens and not human beings. Whatever do you mean? Oh, uh, remember when I said that Dell has a ton of 10th uh, gen laptops coming out or 10th gen Intel 
uh, I'm, powered I'm, laptops. I'm sure out. they do because Intel was talking about something like 90 different models coming from their partners by holiday 2019. So, so. the XPS 13, uh, the XPS 13 two in one, which is available now for purchase. Um, that's like the first Project Athena verified laptop. Remember mm. Project Athena? Um, Inspiron Remember 13, Centrino? 15, 17, 7,000. Don't get me started. Inspiron 14, 15, <laughs> 5,000, two in one. The Inspiron 13, 5,000. The Inspiron 24, 5,000 and 27, 7,000 all in ones. The Inspiron 14 and 15, 5,000 series. And the 3,000 series, which we rarely talk about in the 14, 15 and 17 inch models. So, uh, they are rolling out all sorts of stuff. Uh, we won't talk about it t today. But they had a really cool, um, they had a really, really slick. Uh, so the Optiflex line, which is their sort of enterprise lineup, they had some really interesting stuff going on there in terms of a what essentially amounts to a monitor that mounts a discrete computing unit on top on the back of it and uh i've got some oh i saw this we'll it's like built into week. the back of the stand right yeah it's really 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 cool <laughs> um yeah i mean it was it's it's a really clean design um it was a really clean design so We'll have to yeah. talk about that one later and get some pictures. <laughs> I like the idea. So. Instead of strapping a mini PC to the back, like some some solutions, like a lot of mini PCs come with a Visa mount adapter or Vesa mount adapter, and you literally just yeah. screw the mini PC to this, and then you screw that to the back of the monitor, and hopefully the monitor stand does not require the same mount holes, and then you can have a sort of all-in-one PC solution at your workstation, and this just puts the computer in the actual stand and yeah. on the back with a panel that comes off to access it. So interesting design idea. It's yeah, it's uh, it was, I was really impressed by it. Um, if you want to look that up, it's the uh, 77, 70, 70 ultra. Um, gotcha. Yeah. We'll have some more. We'll talk about that some more next week. The uh, I was fascinated by this. You guys did a couple articles on it. Uh, you talked about it, and then um, um, you guys found a follow-up going hands-on with it. Uh, Scott Michaud did a follow-up on it. And I haven't told you what it is. Um, Minecraft has an RTX update. Yes. What's the, you know... It, it, I don't know how many Minecraft players are in the audience. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience with kids who play Minecraft. Uh, you know, is, R is Minecraft the killer application for rtx <laughs> i certainly think that every time they do this where they take something that has a low uh polygonal complexity if that's the right term and then do their fully ray trace magic like we saw with that that quake 2 project the vulcan path tracing project and of course we ended up getting that retail like uh quake 2 rtx that's on steam this is another example of you take something that that's very familiar to people. They know exactly what it looks like. Right. And then you show them the RTX on version. And side by side, it's completely different. So it's very easy to demo the difference where you go from sort of diffuse ambient lighting to now you have these points of light and light beaming in through openings. And you have, I'm going down the list there, have direct lighting from the sun, Sky, various light sources. They have per pixel emissive lighting now. Mm -hmm. The reflections, all sorts of things. It it's it's the full, the fully path traced road, which does incur a significant performance penalty. So that's the next right. thing. And I know Eurogamer has already done some hands-on testing at Gamescom. So I'm sure we'll see a lot more about this, but the fully path traced road does take a hit. Like if, like if you played that that version of uh, Quake Two, that open source project, it's not something that you probably want to get into, even if you have a high end Pascal card, like a a 10 series okay. GPU. You're going to want a a 20 series card. You're going to want an RTX card, okay. probably. I mean, right at this point, Minecraft plays on everything imaginable and plays at a high frame rate so this is going to be well i'm laughing because uh, my boys play minecraft primarily on first generation ipads um 
you know, and then we also yeah. have some a couple of significantly newer Android tablets. And my son's played around with it some on like a Core i5, but Minecraft will play. I'm sure there's, you know, at some point in the next year or two, somebody will have a watch app for Minecraft, but it is it is not a particularly strenuous game. Um, one of the things that, that I thought was interesting with the Eurogamer uh, uh, write-up um, where they got hands-on with, with the RTX ray tracing was they talked about Sonic Ether's shader mod and how that that basically Mojang started working on this right around the time Sonic Ether did their brute. But let me let me quote this. Sonic Ether's RT shader mod for Minecraft, which brute forced full path tracing onto the Java version of the classic Mojang title. Uh, and it was slow. So yes. this is literally running. They've only been working on it for a few months. Um, I'm really curious uh, to see how this works out. And if you uh, you or any of your if you have a child and they might want a GPU after seeing this video, don't show them this video. If you are a Minecraft no. enthusiast and you're curious what it looks like, uh, go to Eurogamer.net or go to PC Per and uh, search for Minecraft RTX, and uh, you'll get a link to the demo video. It's impressive. I mean that 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 side by side still. Um, that is the you know, RTX on RTX off that's in your article is just mind blowing because of, you know, the sort of Buddha's rays lighting effects, the difference between the plants, these sort of hanging plants, uh, is kind of mind blowing, uh, and the so the textures and stuff. Yeah. These two, these shots side by side, I was just kind of like, Whoa. So, you know, it turns out you want your thousand dollar GPU to make your incredibly, low resolution eight bitty games look really slick. <laughs> I don't know if it's on our list. That actually reminds me because there was a pretty significant and forgive me if I'm skipping this on the, the list here, but the graphics driver update that NVIDIA dropped at Gamescom right at the same time, it brings a couple of pretty significant features, one of which is improving the way that pixel art or retro games look Integer scaling. We talked about this a little while back because Intel was talking about how Gen 11 graphics is going to have integer scaling, which is basically like that nearest neighbor kind of thing where it it just it it uses the pixels that you have to expand the image instead of using lower resolution interpolation and sort of smearing it to fill every available pixel, regardless of what your screen resolution is. And if you've seen scaling. Upscaling is problematic with low-resolution content. It, it's that way in your living right. room. If you're trying to watch some old 480 stuff, like DVD quality stuff, on a 4K TV, depending on your TV and how good the scaler is, it can look really, really soft and blurry, or it might look a little bit better. But the great thing about PC is if you have the ability to do integer scaling, you can fill up most of your screen and have it look just as sharp as its native resolution. And the side-by-side that Intel had, or Intel, well, in this case, NVIDIA had, was just as impressive as looking at Minecraft off versus on with RTX to me. Because it shows a pixel art game, and it says, you know, this works just as well with emulators or, you know, obviously DOSBox or something like that. You have a, a 320 by 240 DOS game. Now I can actually play it on a modern PC if I have an NVIDIA touring card and have almost perfect scaling. So that was a huge deal to me, and that's out now. Just the current NVIDIA driver, if you just go download it, offers the choice of integer scaling in the control panel. Enable that if you're doing any kind of emulation or any kind of uh, pixel art game, and it'll make a huge difference. Well, we're talking about fun. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting write-up over at VentureBeat, uh, and they talked about the Oculus Quest, and, you know, they... The, the, the basically the idea was it keeps improving in quote important but screenshot defying ways i.e it's hard for us to to explain to you what's going on here um but the, they're kind of really hitting on two things one is is developers are figuring out how to make graphics better um and how to really get the most out of that uh, cell phone <laughs> processor inside of there that 850 i want to say it's an 855 if memory serves um and uh but you know, one of the big things on that was Red Matter's uh, redesign of the uh, of the uh, Unreal Engine, and uh, or I should say, uh, Vertical Robot. Uh, their showcase title is Red Matter, but they they rewrote and 
did a lot of work on real on the on the real engines mobile shaders um glass effects surface reflections um just a really really impressive set of mods they did to that to make graphics look amazing uh but the other thing they pointed out is that uh oculus keeps making updates to quests guardian and inside out tracking and that they, they keep getting better and uh I don't know how excited or not excited uh, everybody listening or watching is about VR at this point, but I do like the fact that Oculus didn't just sort of vomit out a product and, you know, start working on the next thing. They actually seem to be working really, really hard to make the Oculus Quest do a really, really good job. So um, kind of tempted to pick one up again, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, get a couple projects going on. I need to wrap up before I, 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 I bring a VR headset into the house, lest I'd be beaten to death by any of a number of family members. But, uh, it is interesting that Oculus is working really, really hard to make this, uh, run well. And maybe I think possibly because they feel that if they don't make the Oculus quest work, then VR is going to sort of die on the vine for a lot of people. Um, I don't know. That may be a little dramatic but i'm really curious to see you know what kind of stuff is happens towards the holiday buying season this year if there are any discounts if there are any new games if there are any killer apps coming out but uh interesting read if you're kind of curious about what's going on on the oculus quest and uh, yes it is getting better over time so uh from the uh uh public service announcement desk <laughs> here at This Week in Computer Hardware. Um, do yourself a favor, especially if you run a small business or more likely if you run a, uh, a small government, um, back up your data. Have a plan for if you get hit with ransomware. Um, there's a crazy easy article up on ZDNet. Over 20 Texas local governments hit in coordinated ransomware attack and uh, 23... Local Texas governments have been infected with ransomware last week, and what Texas officials have described as a coordinated attack. Uh, Catalan Simpanu for Zero Day uh, has the write-up on that one. It is, you know, we saw Baltimore get shut down. We've seen hospitals get shut down. Um, 23 cities in Texas is, I think, a new level of insanity uh, in some ways. Um, you know, there's no, uh, the, they have a number, 23. They don't have a list, a public list that I know of at this point. Um, but, uh, man, this is messy. Uh, and this this seems like it's it's gone completely over from something that happens occasionally and draws a lot of notoriety to, oh, this is something that happens fairly regularly. So, uh, and that was one of the things that happened with Baltimore is they they had their their sort of you know IT security people were like, we need a plan for this, we need to do these things, and they went, yeah, there's no budget for that. Um, it it may be time to start thinking about budget for that because this may be becoming a cottage industry uh, that is really schwacking. Uh, <laughs> governments and hospitals and who knows how many companies have been hit with stuff like this but they've managed to keep it more quiet so back up your stuff have a plan for ransomware um start at least thinking about it at this point because it's not going away hmm. hey do you want to read uh, bernard's question sebastian sure so bernard wrote to us at twitch at twit.tv dear twitch crew I'm looking to probably start doing a new build of a computer. I was looking to build something that won't break the bank yet. Highly competitional capable, like uh, something that's going to be really advanced, really fast, handling large data sets in particular. We're talking, yes, <laughs> computational. I saw the E and I got hung up. We're talking about large three to four gigabytes. Oh, they're talking about data sets then. Containing right. at least four dimensions, weather modeling software. So this is a very particular use case, but... Thinking about getting a case, uh, so pretty much the whole package then at this point, if you're also adding in a new enclosure. Right. Uh, interesting, though, looking for wood and not metal, plastic, or glass. Which pretty so, much means DIY, bespoke, and occasionally Etsy, because I don't think at this yeah. point there's any body doing any large commercial amounts of, of wooden PC enclosures. And I've um, seen a little bit, but it was always like a wood veneer over right. a metal enclosure. I know that LGR a while back had a PC that was based actually on, I think, a Fantex case, but the 
the manufacturer had put wood panels over the outside of it. It was not a wooden enclosure, though. There was uh, there's a small local company in Alameda, or I should say a local maker in Alameda, and uh, there was an Alameda Maker Fair uh, a week ago. And he took Japanese uh, architectural influences and blended them with case designs. And it is, it, they were extraordinary. Um, they would be, to have one, he did them as a hobby. Uh, I did not ask the price if uh, he would, because it sounded like he was kind of making the, the turn from them being a hobby to being a business. But I feel comfortable in saying that these would be 1000 to $2,000 enclosures. Um, you know, because uh, and you get into some really interesting issues. If you build a wooden case, um, the FCC is probably not going to come for you. If somebody wants to sell a wooden case, they still have to get FCC approval if memory serves. Um, wow, I just realized I have no idea what the relationship with with uh, FCC testing and cases are. Um, that's a giant gaping hole in my knowledge that. I could have sworn was there. Uh, I know that it's big either. over in Europe because the, some of the comments about some of these projects for retro machines, for example, has come up where right. people will complain about the pricing and the these entrepreneurs who like put this all together will will try to explain like when you buy the the version that will come out from China as a knockoff, they're not actually following any of the rules that we have to follow. Right. They're making their enclosure out of whatever. They're not worried about interference. And they're required to use metal, for example, if they have a uh, potential for interference. They're having to machine these cases, and they're, they're completely different standards. I know, obviously, we have our own standards here, but it's it's just, you know, it's worth knowing that it's often, there's a reason that the thing has the enclosure that it does, or that there is the shielding inside of it that it has. Uh, and if it right. were a wood enclosure, there would have to be some sort of metal lining, I'm sure, because of, you know, flame fire concerns there's the computer generates a lot of heat you know, just, obviously the solution is to just go with wood grain contact paper i put a link <laughs> in the chat for the famous lgr wood grain 486 where he took an old pc case and wood grain contact paper and he took the faceplate off he did you know did it the right way put it all on, cut it to size, put it back together, and it looks like it was meant to be that way. It's a wood grain computer tower. You could do this with any tower. Buy a simple computer. doesn't have to have a glass side panel or anything. Save yourself some money on the case and right. uh, just stick a bunch of contact paper on it. I mean, I actually, what could possibly go wrong? While. Well, you know what? It's funny. I actually have seen cases. Uh, there's a company that does them for Sonos speakers. I've seen them in the past where they did a short run of custom wooden, basically boxes that would drop over a popular PC case. This was years and years ago, but that might be a way to do that. So you can still, you know, not flood your home with, with RF energy that you don't particularly want flooding your home. Um, but, uh, you know, to to bring it back to what we were saying before, the the problem with wooden PC cases is is they tend to be really really expensive, um, and really really difficult to you know mass produce. I think uh, at least we haven't seen anyone do it uh, almost ever. Um, you know, if you know one out there, or if you know somebody who's making them, definitely uh, email twitch at twit.tv. Um, getting back to the sort of you know, computational power and large data sets. Um, you know, large data sets, really, really similar to handling large video f uh, files. Uh, you want more memory, uh, you know, check forums uh, with people who run your applications. You know, 1632, 64 gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigabytes of RAM at this point is uh, as cheap as it's been in a long time. Um, and uh, 32 gigabytes is pretty affordable at this point. Uh, and you also, you know, we've talked recently around the idea that memory speed is not as critical depending on the part you're using. However, in certain applications, especially AMD, first and second order horizons, um, getting the right memory will make a healthy difference in performance or one that you might actually feel in real life, not just be able to, to test in benchmarks. But uh, you definitely want an SSD. You definitely want an NVMe SSD. Um, yeah, and those are the kind of the, you know, you want, you know, whenever you're dealing with large, 
amounts of data and acting on it. You want all of the cores you can get. You want all the speed you can throw at those cores. You want a cooling system that's going to keep that CPU cool so you can run all of those cores flat out. You want the fastest memory you can bolt onto there. You want as much memory as you can bolt onto there. And you want to get the information off the hard drive to the memory as, as fast as possible. So you want to figure out what the fastest uh, you know, hard drive you can afford is, which for most people is going to be a NVMe uh, SSD and an M.2 package that goes down on the motherboard. Um, you know, for specific applications, it's always good to nose around and see what people are running uh, or to ask, uh, you know, people in forums for the applications you use. Because sometimes 64 gigabytes will help. You're, you know, editing massive 4K videos. Uh, other times, not particularly useful. And there's no point in spending all that money on memory uh, if you're not going to need it. You know, some people are like, buy 128 gigabytes, you're future proofing. It's like, no. Because by the time applications need 128 gigabytes of RAM, we'll be one or two generations of RAM ahead from now, and it'll be much faster <laughs> for the same But Patrick, price, you can hopefully. buy 32 gigabyte DIMMs now. Why not? Let buy us... a board that has eight DIMM slots and just fill it up. Although well, I will say, really, what I should have said was, this is it's time for our obligatory Ryzen 9 3900X reference. Because why wouldn't you put 12 cores and 24 threads at this? Why wouldn't you? Well, exactly. maybe it's an application that can only have four you know, cores. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. When and, it's application specific, it's, it becomes hard to make a recommendation for sure. Unless you're familiar yeah. with the application, which I am not. So... Hopefully, Bernard, that helps out a little bit. We want to hear your email questions. Email twitch at twit.tv. Uh, we have an interesting... Uh, this is a tweet, actually, not a, an email question we'll be getting into next week, which talks extensively about security and repairing phones and a somewhat different perspective on it uh, than I had mm -hmm. uh, when discussing Apple's latest firmware update and what it did to non-Apple or batteries installed by people other than Apple-approved repair shops or uh, Apple geniuses. But again, we'll talk about that next week. Um, Navi GPU architecture white paper published. Uh, what uh, what can you tell us? Were you overwhelmed, underwhelmed, terrified? Was it pages of dense engineering and mathematics that caused you to weep with joy? Well, there's there was some weeping, but not necessarily from joy. I mean, it's it's fascinating. <laughs> uh, it's the thing about graphics is it's a lot of math. And if you weren't particularly strong in math, if you go through a white paper on exactly how a graphics architecture works, it starts to hurt, and it just hurts more and more <laughs> as you go. But this is actually a, just a, a, the same stuff, basically, that the press who were invited out to uh, the pre-E3 event that AMD held when they were announcing to media before the actual RX 5700 series graphics card launch, and they were being very careful to explain to media and show us all the slide and basically show their work and show the proof of the fact that yes, in fact, indeed, our DNA is a new graphics architecture because there were leaks and speculation that it was just graphics core next all over again, the same graphics architecture that AMD had been using since 2012. And it's not. I mean, it has some similarities to it with the structure of it with the topology of it but the actual from the from the very base all the way through it's different it's much more highly optimized obviously they're getting huge performance gains out of it and it's fascinating to just look through this if only to kind of glance at the graphics and see historically how their architectures have changed through time and just look at things like the level 1 cache and the similarities the things they brought over from Ryzen, like the, the stuff that they've learned from their Zen architecture that they've applied to what's running Navi, this RDNA architecture. And it's pretty fascinating stuff. And it's it's interesting to look at the basis of it and see how, in fact, you can take a graphics card that only has 40 of these compute units and have it completely outperform a 64 compute unit graphics card from the previous architecture. So from GCN with the Vega 64 to Navi with Navi 10, which is a 40 CU part that's in the 5700 and 5700 XT. Although of course the non XT version only has 36 enabled, but still 
tremendous improvement. And I, I can't wait to see how this translates into that big Navi part that we've kind of been right. speculating about and heard rumors about, because that's going to be phenomenal. And I, I don't, they did not specify to us if indeed, I haven't read the whole white paper, if indeed this architecture is limited to 64 CUs, just like Graphics Core Next was. So if there will still be a cap at 4,096 streaming processors like there was before. But we've already seen that this is such a big performance improvement that that's not really going to matter until, obviously, NVIDIA comes out with their next architecture, and then it will matter. Because right now, Navi, a uh, 5700 XT comes really close to the performance of, say, a 2070 Super and... It's just below the performance of a Radeon 7, which flirted with RTX 2080 performance levels. So it's, you know, fascinating stuff. And if you're technically minded and or if you love math, then take mm -hmm. a look at this white paper. They have published it. They published it a couple nights ago. It's freely available for anybody as a PDF file. And you can look at all the stuff that they showed the media back in early June about our DNA. Asus reveals true of new X299 mother motherboards and inadvertently reveals <laughs> i9-10,000 series, apparently. Yes. Yeah. Thanks Oops. to people on Twitter who snap up those screenshots never to be deleted. And the I think it was from the Prime X299 Edition 30, because if you're not aware, Asus has been celebrating their 30th anniversary. And right in the specifications from the screenshot from... Momomo underscore US on Twitter, is where this originated from, is a reference to Intel Core i9 10,000 X series CPU. So I'm assuming that does not dun, mean 10,000 of them. But in fact, Intel's captivating new numbering scheme, which contains more letters and numbers than you can possibly imagine. We didn't even get into that with uh, Comet Lake, where they've tweaked it again. But yeah. It's going to be like a 10310 or, or part names like that. You're going to have to start getting used to that. Uh, five, right. five numerical, and then like there are characters at the end of it if it's one of the mobile processors like U and Y. But it's, I'm curious to see because they're saying this, this uh, Cascade Lake X design, it's for up to 18 core processors. So. Uh, this is an update to X299. One of the things about these new motherboards from Asus is that they're, they've gone with much more uh, powerful power delivery. So mm -hmm. more phases, more actual discrete, like true phases, not using doublers. So a lot of the stuff they've learned from building up boards for X570 apparently is now moving over to the Intel side of things. So really beefy power delivery for what I assume will be somewhat power-hungry High performance processors since Intel has not moved desktop down to 10 nanometer yet to get more gigahertz and more performance out of the existing architecture. They're probably just going to increase clock speeds and therefore power. Hmm. Speaking of clock speeds and power, uh, the crew over at, uh, oh my goodness, the FBS review did a really fantastic look at the AMD Radeon 5700 and 5700 XT. What they're basically saying, we wanted to establish a baseline for 5700, 5700 XT overclocking, uh, you know, with the original flagship cards from the manufacturers. The uh, uh, it's it's they went deep um, in some really intense ways. Uh, the short version, uh, what I will reveal to you. And for all of the magnificent details uh, and the full story, go over to fpsreview.com. Excuse me, the fpsreview.com. Um, the 5700, they got like 4 to 5% uh, performance boost out of it. There's not a lot of room to yeah. play with that. There's a fair number of limitations on what you can actually tweak on these. Um, the 5700 XT, quote, we had a bit better luck. Uh, they couldn't max out the limitations on the clock speed sliders. Um, they raised the power limit. They raised the core clock speed. Um, so you know, you know, it, their biggest takeaway from that is as soon as they started really overclocking it, um, 
you know, the the power and uh, the temperature readings. Quote, the power and temperature readings went through the roof, as in the the fan on the 5700 XT is, quote, completely inadequate for overclocking. So, uh... <laughs> yeah. And, of course, we're talking the reference blower, right. which, as has been discussed uh, at outlets like Gamers Nexus, where they modified the installation of it by adding some washers to the back and taking out the thermal pads. Because if you if you look at the way that the, the cooler is actually designed, they're using a thermal right. pad between the primary heat sink and the GPU die itself, where if you look at one of the stock coolers on an NVIDIA card, they actually have right. thermal interface material, like an actual paste against the GPU. And so that that makes a difference. They, they had talked about that with the Radeon 7, because with Radeon 7, they did the same thing. They're just using right. pads that you would normally see, like even in really high performance applications, like a water block, as I learned in the last couple of weeks, you're you're still using thermal interface material, just some sort of paste with your die, and you use the pads for the, the memory and the VRMs and that sort of thing. But AMD right. is using it for everything. They're just putting a pad on all of it, and it makes it, it gives them a greater margin of error, but yeah. it results in much higher temperatures it's so. simple and it's fast and it's really inefficient and it's not optimal. Um, no. I mean, the part of not, I'm not going to say reading between the lines because they, they flat out said it. Um, you know, these are cards, these are great cards for, you know, if you, if you're, if you got 349, if you got 399 uh, for a 5700 XT, these are fantastic cards at those price points. Um, you know, uh, if you get 10%, overclocking uh you know in some games it was six percent they said some games it was ten percent um you're gonna have a ridiculously loud fan and you're still only getting ten percent which is not huge uh we've seen considerably larger gains you know when developers uh update the code on their optimize the code on their game or if uh you know nvidia or amd optimizes the code in their drivers ten percent isn't a huge gain and uh you know, for the 5700 XT, it's going to be a very loud card at that point, unless you have a a significantly better than uh, a stock <laughs> cooling system on there. So, yeah, and uh, it's, it's it's good read though. The, it, yeah, it is. It's very good read. And if you don't know the FPS review, and you have to use the word the because otherwise you're not going to find it. The FPS review right. is is the basically the entire staff of Hard OCP after Kyle left. Brent Justice, who was Kyle's primary GPU editor, he's still doing these reviews. He wrote this review. So it's a very good resource for very oh, wow. in-depth reviews on all of this stuff from the old hard OCP crew. So definitely check it out. I was going to say, there's not a whole lot of headroom on these GPUs. That's the thing. We, As we learned, I my own brief foray into overclocking recently, even with NVIDIA cards. And when I was doing my testing of these reference cards, as with everybody else, the drivers were pretty much broken at that point. We couldn't really do overclocking right. testing. And then, of course, now that we can, everybody's learning, yeah, you can get like 4 or 5%. Gamers Nexus has <laughs> run into the problem where even with liquid nitrogen, they get to a certain point with the memory where this, the memory is clearly holding the GPU back and they can't get any more bandwidth out of the memory, which is where it starts to beg the question, what could Navi do with the same ultra-high bandwidth memory that Radeon 7 has? But I don't know if we're ever going to see that or not. But I, I think back to when I had a stock cooler on a, a Radeon HD 5870. So we're talking a long time ago. Default clock on that was 850 megahertz. And you could easily get a gigahertz out of the card. Well, if, if you had the right card, you'd get a gigahertz out of it. But you were not going to do right. that with a stock cooler. And I was one of those who went out and I paid something like $70 or $80 for one of those three-fan Arctic coolers and, and did the whole gluing heat sinks on all the VRMs and all that stuff. And I ran mine at a gigahertz and it was a huge performance boost and it was quieter than the stock cooler. But there are certain things you can and can't do with these reference designs from AMD. And they've stuck with this blower design. Even when we've seen, we saw triple axial fans from the Radeon 7, but I think they pretty much had to because that was such a, a hot card that if they hadn't gone with it's a very, very heavy card, by the way. It's a huge heat sink under that thing. If they hadn't gone with that, they would have had probably 60 decibels under load. And instead, they they managed to bring that down to about 50. But 
as they explained to us, and I've mentioned it, I'm sure, on the show before, the blower design, yes, people like to hate it. It does technically work. We have, they claim it's good up to like 110 degrees. That's how high the card can go before it starts to throttle. And they've tailored it for a lower noise profile, which further hurts the performance of the cooler. And it's pretty much designed for system integrators. So a lower cost gaming system. I'm sure one of those Alienware PCs we talked about earlier, the new Aurora. And in my experience, having had my hands on a lot of Dell systems over the last five years, if you're buying a system like that, like an HP Omen or a Dell Alienware, you're probably getting AMD's official reference card in that enclosure, and it allows them to use smaller heat sinks on the CPU, uh, lower performance intake or exhaust fans, and basically cope with a much smaller thermal load because almost all the hot air is being exhausted out the back of the case, whereas a aftermarket mm -hmm. design is pushing a lot of hot air into the case, which then means they have to use a more robust CPU cooler. They have to use, uh, they have to have better airflow in the case, or they're going to have performance issues, or they're going to have problems with surface mounted components on the motherboards, dying prematurely, all of the things that they take into consideration when they're planning out one of these computers that an enthusiast right. is not necessarily worried about. Enthusiast goes out, buys a third party CPU cooler, like a one of the hyper. 212 Evos or something, and they have plenty of cooling if they have a case with good airflow, and they don't care if they have an aftermarket design on their GPU. In fact, they prefer it. And we heard a lot of comments about, like, I love the idea of these new Navi cards, but I'm waiting for the third-party uh, cards to come out. And they just won't buy a blower cooler anymore, which is understandable. But uh, somehow this was all related to the fact that there's not a whole lot of overclocking headroom with GPUs anymore, <laughs> but I got on kind of a rant there. So yeah, rant. Uh, overclocking, you get about 5% AMD or NVIDIA. So it's not like the old days where I was overclocking the snot out of cheaper cards, like my 560 Ti that I turned into a 570 by pushing as much voltage mm -hmm. and clock speed at it as I possibly could. Oh my goodness. Uh, Tech Radar kind of went off uh, the deep end in a nice way. Uh, gathering sort of all the Apple Watch 5 rumors they could. Um, one of the big ones coming from, there's a fairly successful uh, tipster in the uh, in the Macintosh world, uh, Ming-Chi Kuo. Uh, Apple Watch 5, basically prediction, Apple Watch 5 this year, there's going to be ceramic options, maybe titanium cases, uh, Watch OS 6. Beta code is also out. And I think it was, uh, yeah, Brazilian site I Help BR quotes spotted graphics hidden in the beta code of Watch OS 6 that points to ceramic and titanium casings, quite possibly for the Apple Watch 5, but maybe as new options alongside stainless steel for the Apple Watch 4. Um, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you are not aware, the Apple Watch is the best selling smartwatch pretty much flat out period end of discussion at this point um but uh yeah second half 2019 is when that's expected um be really really curious to see what they add in because uh uh you know the ecg monitor is pretty fascinating the fall monitor is pretty fascinating um two-way wireless charging is apparently coming um which is the whole like you can put it on the back of your, you know, your next generation, your iPhone 11, uh, and charge your watch off your phone, um, which sounds it's complicated, but and a little probably, terrifying. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but I, it's also having you, carried around a, a watch charger that gets really irritating too. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but can you wirelessly charge your phone while your phone is wirelessly charging your watch? That's that's what we need to know. So. But, you know, maybe we can. Maybe that technology is coming. Daisy chain all the wireless charging things on top of each other in one huge, incredibly hot stack of uh, electronics. Just send huge amounts of, you know, electrical energy through the air and see how many of us get turned into something that resembles a fried chicken. It's a mm -hmm. thought. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Uh, one last story before we go. Do we have time for one more story? Maybe? We're waiting Bueller? We're waiting on the producer. I say yes, so but I'm not yes. in charge yeah. here. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure, is not as enthusiastic as I'd like to hear. Can we try that again, Kevin? <laughs> 
How about a little bit wow. uh, more pep this time? Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Or just say, if you must. <laughs> okay. If you insist. Yeah, I thought we were done, but all right. Have you guys heard about short. what three words? What? Because I'm, I'm a map nerd. I'm a GPS nerd. I'm a navigation nerd. Okay. I had never heard about this till uh, this BBC News article floated up on Pocket or somewhere. I'm not entirely sure how it got in front of my face. Um, their subtitle, their subhead of this is the app that can save your life. And I don't want to get into that at the moment, but it's really crazy. They divided the word world. They basically divided the surface of the world into like, I want to say three by three foot, nine square foot squares. So... It is kind of insane. There's 57 trillion squares, and they use a series of three words to distinctly identify each little chunk of the surface of the planet. So if you run the app on their, your phone, like I'm in a field somewhere, I'm in some part of London, I'm in some part of Cleveland, like I don't know where I am, uh, but I need help, uh, their app will basically give you a three word combination, unit pillow culling, right? And if you go up to uh, what3words.com, you can actually like look up your address and find out like what the, the names of the three letter names are of the different squares that make up your house. Um, you know, it's really interesting because it's a, mm. you know, I, I was watching people sort of debate this on Twitter and you know, somebody's like, oh, but you can't tell the relationship of individual squares to each other based on the words that compose them. And I, I kind of get this sort of elegant solution uh, that, that he was moving towards. Well, it's the second time I've used solution in one day. It's a lot. Um, but the idea is that these randomly selected words are something you could read off of an app and are fairly easy to identify for the people that are, for example, trying to find you if you're lost somewhere. Um, it's pretty crazy. And, uh, um, I just found it fascinating because it's such a radically different way of, you know, if you if you've ever done latitude and longitude, um, it's it's not simple and it's a lot of numbers, <laughs> you know, and you know, you know, you know, latitude thirty eight dot four seven one four six two is a lot harder to do than you know, weasel aardvark pillow, you know. Um, it was interesting. Uh, what three words is the name of the app? What three words is the website? Uh, if you've never seen it, it's it's interesting. Or you can email twitch at twit.tv or tweet at Patrick Norton and say, this is stupid. Um, I don't think it's stupid. Um, but uh, what three words is the app? And uh, it's a really kind of wild way to look at the uh, to look at the uh, the surface of the planet. I have to figure out what the three words are for uh, uh, jump humbug, which is a, a very small place, a, a natural feature in Utah. Let's call it that. Isn't but, uh, jump humbug already a good enough name? Because then you're just going to add another yes. word to meet the three word True. requirement. Maybe they conveniently, you know, managed to get jump and humbug into the three word requirement for that. If it's jump <laughs> humbug humbug. In fact, I'm going to find out right now. <laughs> What three words? As I turn my microphone back on. Let's see. What three words? And you said it's called Jump Humbug? Yeah, I think it's the Jump Trail in the Humbug Canyon. The first time I saw the signboard uh, was you know, Jump Humbug. I think you're just sort no of looking over this giant canyon in Utah. It says no results. Hmm. Well, it's a well, pretty obscure I mean, place. That only exists in Patrick's mind. No, no, it's a place. I'll bring you pictures. Humbug. And everybody knows pictures never lie. <laughs> Humbug Canyon? That sounds about right. Okay. Yeah. Jump Humbug. I can see the, the BLM sign in my head. Jump Humble? Uh, is it? No. Jump Humble is a kid friendly. Uh, Air Trampoline and Adventure Park. Oh, I've, I've, the, we have one of these places in town here. Like a, it's like <laughs> all the floors are bouncy and you can just jump and play everywhere. The kids love it. Yeah. The jump, so the jump trail is the cattle trail that goes down into the Humbug Canyon. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
I know you think I'm making all this. I'll up. take your word for it. I I cannot verify <laughs> what you're saying on the Google, so I I have to question it. Sorry. That's perfectly reasonable if you're going to be that way. <laughs> PCPer.com is the website to find Mr. Sebastian Peake's work at his day job. PCPer is, of course, a place to get hardware reviews and news, and it is some good stuff. If you haven't gone there, go there today. You can find more of me. Uh, well, you know what? Stick with This Week in Computer Hardware. And uh, Robert and I are in the process of relaunching AV Excel, which you've heard me say all summer long, but the summer is ending and it's time to go back to school. But uh, if you have a question for us, Tweet at Sebastian Peak or at Patrick Dorton. You can also share a story with us or a hardware tip, uh, but questions are also always good at Sebastian Peak or at Patrick Dorton on Twitter or email twitch at twit.tv. And if this is your first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, welcome. And then please head over to twit.tv slash twitch where you'll get all the information on how to subscribe or search for This Week in Computer Hardware on your favorite podcatcher. We'd love for you to subscribe and join us each and every week. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. Catch you next week on Twitch. <laughs> <laughs>